This morning we have two scripture passages uh, to share. The first comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Lord, thou who art over us, thou who art one of us, thou who art, grant us a pure heart that we may see thee, a humble heart that we may hear thee, a heart of love that we may serve thee, a heart of faith that we may always abide in thee. Amen. The power of one. A small church was meeting one Sunday for worship. When it came time to sing the first hymn, the organist prepared to play the introduction. She pressed the keys, but not a sound came out of the instrument. She started to change the stops. She adjusted the volume. She pushed harder on the keys and the pedals, but nothing would happen. She had a dire look at the minister who stepped up to the pulpit and asked if, if anyone could come and maybe help figure out what's wrong with the organ. And of course, a bunch of men came forward and they don't read instructions and don't need it, so they thought they could fix it. Started working around it. But in the corner was a caretaker who was just looking at this commotion with interest. He got up from his seat, came over, picked up the electrical plug and put it into the socket. <laughs> the organ came alive with majestic sound. It just took one. One thought, 
one solution, one leader, one initiative, one action, one person who can always make the difference. So today we begin a journey. It's going to be a short one, but I hope it will be a grand adventure. And as we begin this journey, if I may take a few moments this morning to set forth what I would envision to be our two priorities at all times to be a vibrant community of faith. And for each one of us, it's important that we make that priority in our own lives because this church will never be fully what it can be without each of us in our roles. The first one uh, related to the first text that Ben read came out of the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah experienced the living God that day in the temple. And it profoundly changed his life. And so it's my intention, as your interim pastor, that worship at Central be dynamic, relevant, life-giving, life-sustaining, and deploring. In the words of Kierkegaard, worship must comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. We see in, in the prophecy of Isaiah, he was touched. He was touched literally, but also figuratively by the living God. And so when we gather to worship, we connect to Jesus Christ. And by being connected, we are grounded in him who is the source, the only true living source of our life. And when we want to gather, we come with who we are. We have our worries, we have our stresses, our anxieties in life. We see our nation right now so polarized, so divided, violence breaking out all over the place. Every day we hear of another atrocity. We worry about the economy. With inflation taking its toll even now, we probably have a lot of anxiety about our own personal finances. We stressed out over our health. I am on a sonic jet toward the age of 60. And I am here to tell you that aging is not for the faint of heart. One of my questions when I finally get before the Almighty in heaven is going to be, Lord, why did you waste youth on the young? <laughs> and then there's COVID. COVID that afflicts young and old regardless of circumstance. And while it seems that there is some Good news coming around with the rates, it is still there. And I'm afraid we will have to learn to live with this virus. Many of you are tasked with caring for a spouse, or for an aging parent. Many of you have children or grandchildren in which you have responsibilities for. And all of that, we need the touch of God for our well-being. How do you know when God reaches out and touches you? God touch, God's moving allows us to know in those holy moments, those times when we are surrounded with the holy. Our souls are nurtured, our spirits are fed, our hearts, our minds, they are transformed. How God moves in those times is beyond our comprehension. But oh, when you know it, it is so. It's an old story, but it's so true. There was a very devout man who never missed weekly worship in his church. But his dear wife died, and since they had attended church together for so long, he lost his urge and desire to go to it alone. After several weeks of noticeable absence, his pastor took an opportunity to visit him, inquire not only, not only how he was doing, but to find a way to encourage him to return to the flock. It was in the winter, and the man had built a roaring fire in his fireplace, and the two of them sat and visited, and they came to a moment when they were both just very quiet. The pastor took a pair of tongs, 
reached into the fire and took out a red hot ember and laid it on the hearth and sat back down. And when just a few moments that red hot ember turned very dark ash. The man looked at his pastor and said, I get it, Reverend, and I'll be back to church soon. That's what worship does for us. And when even one is out, it is felt. Now, the pandemic has changed how we come to worship, hasn't it? We still have those of you coming in person, but we also have those who are live streaming. And worship is worship in whatever context it might be there, either through technology or through in person. We need to worship. We need to feel the touch of God. Then there's our other text today. Beyond the text of Isaiah, we have the, the gospel reading of Luke where Jesus had a moment of worship and then there was Simon. And he called Simon to go forth and be a fisher of people to do something with that moment of worship. And I call this discipleship. It is simply this. In our discipleship, we become, we become the embodiment of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us. There's an old saying, you may be the only Jesus someone might ever see. And the simplest form of discipleship is this, my friend, is simply be Christ-like. Yeah, there are a whole lot of other things that stem forth from that, but at the very essence is to simply be Christ-like. And being like Christ doesn't mean you've got to become a, a street preacher or some missionary or religious zealot who doesn't live in the real world but instead becomes some fanatic. No, it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, some of the most down-to-earth, Christ-like people I have ever met were just good old folk, regular people, who simply take their faith seriously and live out discipleship wherever they are. In the home, the school, the office, the mill, even in the church. And as unique as each one of us is, we live that out every day. Being the Christ that some may see in that moment. When Jesus sought Peter out, bear in mind, Peter took that call seriously. He had just got a tremendous haul of fish. And scholars tell us today that more than likely, that one single haul of fish may have fed Simon's family for a year. But he had his priorities in right. And he went on to follow Jesus and become that disciple. Even Isaiah got it. What is it? He said when uh, the, the, the beings shouted out, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? When God issued that call, Isaiah said, what? Here I am. Let me go. Let me do what I can. It just comes back to even one making a difference. Every single one of us. And without all, without each one, we are less than we could be. We're not as strong. We lack just a little bit more of who we are and who we can become. I want to share two stories that bring this home. In the 1920s, Al Capone virtually owned the city of Chicago. And we all know Capone was not famous for his virtue. He was notorious for enmeshing the Windy City from everything from bootleg booze and prostitution to murder. Capone had a, a lawyer named Easy Eddie. Now, let me tell you, Easy Eddie was really good for Capone. His legal maneuvering got Capone out of trouble with the law over and over again. And to show his appreciation, Capone paid Easy Eddie very, very well. 
Not only was the, the money big, but he bought uh, Easy Eddie a big old house with all the fanciest. And it took up a whole city block in that day of Chicago. He lived the high life. But Easy Eddie had one soft spot. He had a little boy, and he loved he loved this boy dearly. He saw to it that his son had clothes and cars and servants and a good education all the way through. But despite his involvement with Al Capone, Eddie tried to teach his boy right from wrong. He wanted his son to, to be a better man than he was. But with all his wealth, all of his influence, the one thing Easy Eddie couldn't leave his son was a good name and a good legacy. So he decided to become straight. And he went to the authorities with the truth about Scarface Capone. He testified against him, and it was a part of Easy Eddie's work that Capone was finally uh, jailed for the one reason they got him on, income tax evasion. But within a year, Easy Eddie's life was ended in a blaze of gunfire in a back alley of a Chicago street. But in the end, he left a good name for his son. I'll tell you another story. War, War II produced many wonderful heroes. And one of these men was Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. He was a fighter pilot. He was assigned to the aircraft carrier Lexington in the South Pacific. And one day his entire squadron was sent out on a mission, but while they were airborne, Butch noticed that his fuel tank had not been topped off. He would not have enough fuel to make the mission. So his squadron commander told him to return back to the ship, in which he did. On his way back to the Lexington, he saw a sight that made his blood run cold. A whole squadron of enemy aircraft were headed to the fleet. He didn't have enough fuel to go back to his squadron and tell them, and he couldn't break radio silence. So Butch did the only thing he knew he could do. He dove into those enemy formation with everything he had. He spent his entire ammunition with his uh, 50 caliber gun blazed in a charge. He attacked one surprise plane after another. And when he ran out of ammunition, he used his own wings to try to clip the enemy aircraft wings and tails and sent a couple of them to the sea. Exasperated after a while in this hornet's nest, the enemy squadron pulled aside and went in a different direction. Butch landed his tethered, disrupted uh, airplane onto the Lexington. And on February the 10th, 20th, excuse me, February 20th, 1942, just two months after the, the United States had entered in the war, he became the very first World War II flying ace for the Navy and the first Navy aviator to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. Sadly, though, at age 29, just about a year later, Butch lost his own life in an enemy attack. His hometown wanted to honor the memory of this young man who had given his life for his country. And so today, when you go to Chicago flying in, you will land at the O'Hare International Airport. And if you go between Terminals 1 and 2, you will see a statue of Butch O'Hare with his Medal of Honor on display. Now you're probably wondering, what in the world do these two stories have to do with each other? Butch O'Hare was Easy Eddie O'Hare's son. One. Isaiah was one in that temple whom God sent out after he worshipped. Simon, who became Peter, became the one who left his full nets to follow Christ and help start a movement that changed the world. You and I, we're one. So let us worship, let us be Christ-like disciples, and together, each one of us can make a difference. 
Amen.